Oh, well, all right. Awesome. Let's continue the segment and see if we can get through it without without busting a gut, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, the This day in July history, um, I wanted to mention a few things uh, bef before we actually get to the, we'll, we'll save the, the Hamilton Burr okay. thing for last, but, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that briefly. Uh, in 1713, where is it? I have to dig it up now. Oh, dear. I have too many things to do. Uh, I mentioned Burr and Hamilton. Uh, in 1937, uh, George Gershwin right. passed away. Uh, in fact, they're somewhere out there. Where is it? There is a movie called um, Rhapsody in Blue. Mm -hmm. It was done in 1945. And... Um, you, you, can, you might be able to find the excerpt. I, I, I wasn't able to find it. I just found some random stuff on, on YouTube. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's it's kind of weird because it's it's like it shows. Um, uh, well, Oscar Levant mm -hmm. is is was a talented musician from the era, and he played. I believe he played Gershwin in the movie. Oh, cool! And um, but the, the the movie shows like an orchestra, mm -hmm. or New, you know, the New York Philharmonic or something. And I don't know who the who the conductor might have been. Uh, uh, Mr. Tarkovsky, Mr. Tarkovsky, that, yeah. that guy uh, who was conducting at the time. And and it's just like they they're they're halfway through a particular symphony, and then they just like stop, they pause, and the guy says, "I'm very sorry to tell everyone, but uh, George Gershwin has died." And then, and then they start up the symphony again. <laughs> so wow. it's like, it was like really bizarre. Well, you couldn't, yeah. couldn't have waited until it was over. I don't know. Okay. I, mean, but I don't know. I don't know if that was really how it went down, but it was. Right. Uh, it, it was. It, it's interesting anyway. But it's interesting to watch uh, uh, the movie, and the movie is 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 uh, is really good. And, and I've seen I've seen Oscar Levant in other movies, and and he's okay. he was really a, a talented. He was actually a really talented. Uh, musician, pianist, and mm -hmm. and an actor as well, which oh, is kind of wow. un, which is kind of unusual. Yeah. Um, in 1869, uh, that's, I don't know if that's the one I want to read. In 1877, General Oliver Howard, called Cut Arm or One Arm Soldier Chief by the Indians, was leading the 551st Cavalry, 21st Infantry, and 4th Artillery soldiers when they spotted the Nez Perce. Is that how you say it? Nez Perce. Nez Perce. My wife always makes fun of me for saying it wrong. <laughs> I always say it wrong. Yeah. I can't say sandwich either, by the way. I don't know why I don't know why she makes fun Sounds of me. Sounds fine to me. Yeah. I who knows. Wait, was she was she raised in Texas? Uh, yeah. Oh well. I think she says I say, say it like sand wedge or something. So <laughs> You know, like a golf club. Golf right? club. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> golfing on the rain? Anyway, they spotted these Indians along the Clearwater River and Cottonwood Creek. The fighting lasted until the next day when the Army got reinforcements. The Nez Perce then retreated to the north. During the fighting, the Army reported that it lost 15 dead and 25 wounded soldiers and killed 23 warriors. Accounts from Nez Perce survivors put their losses at only four. First Lieutenant Charles F. Humphrey, 4th Artillery, voluntarily and successfully conducted in the face of withering fire a party which recovered possession of an abandoned howitzer and two Gatling guns lying between the lines a few yards from the Indians. For his actions, Humphrey would be awarded the Medal of Honor. The fighting lasted through the next day. Uh, and that is from This Day in North American Indian History by Phil Constantine. I actually brought the book with me. Um, uh, well, I'll probably, you got it? Oh, yeah, there you, you there got you go. it. No, we don't have to get up. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've mentioned this book before. Uh, I've I've looked at his stuff on, online, and actually, this book is actually well worth it, uh, worth a purchase. Um, you know, you kind of get the impression when you look at his his listings online that uh, you know, like, well, why buy the book? I mean, he's got it. You know, it's right here. He put his book online. Well, no, he's only put like partially what. Some of the some of the listings are so uh, so the book is uh, is uh, is really interesting and really uh, uh, fact filled. Uh, in 1979, Skylab fell, uh, and I have a f excerpt from Frontiers of Space Exploration by Roger D. Lanius. And let's see, and somebody was asking before the show. Uh, just exactly what Skylab was, and uh, right. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. I was like, I think there were people in it, but I, you know, or maybe it was just a satellite up there to take pictures. 
I think it's just a satellite. No, actually, uh, the 100-ton Skylab 1 orbital workshop was launched into orbit on the 14th of May, 1973, mm -hmm. making use of the giant Saturn V launch vehicle for the first for the last time. So it, was, so it used one of the Saturn rockets to get up there. Okay. Uh, almost immediately, technical problems developed due to vibrations during liftoff. 63 seconds after launch, the meteoroid shield, designed also to shade Skylab's workshop from the sun's rays, ripped off, mm -hmm. taking with it one of the spacecraft's two solar panels and another piece wrapped around the other panel to keep it from properly deploying. In spite of this, the space station achieved a near-circular orbit at the desired altitude of 270 miles. NASA's mission control personnel maneuvered Skylab so that its Apollo telescope mount solar panels face the sun to provide as much electricity as possible. I mean, Al Gore was happy about that. We're going to have solar panels. But because of the loss of the meteoroid shield, the positioning caused workshop temperatures to rise 101 million degrees. No, sorry, to rise 126 degrees Fahrenheit. While NASA technicians worked on a solution, uh, the first mission with astronauts aboard was postponed. Oh, okay. So, da, 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 on May 73, astronauts Charles Conrad, Paul Weitz, Joseph Kerwin lifted off from Kennedy Space Center and Apollo capsule atop the Saturn IB and rendezvoused with the Oral Workshop, carried a parasol, carried a parasol, tools, and replacement film. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> like an actual like, like 1800s parasol and the, uh, the, this isn't going to do any good <laughs> <laughs> whose idea was this uh, after substantial repairs requiring extravehicular activity including that sounds naughty doesn't it <laughs> and including deployment of a parasol sunshade that cooled the inside temperature to 75 degrees Fahrenheit by June 4th the workshop was habitable uh, blah 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 Where's, where does it come crashing to Earth? On July 11th, 1979. <laughs> you want the sadistic part. <laughs> Let's hear the good part, the explosions. <laughs> Skylab finally hit the Earth. The debris scattered from southwestern, southeastern Indian Ocean across a sparsely populated section of western Australia. NASA and the U.S. space program took criticism for this development, ranging from the sale of hard hats as Skylab survival kits to serious questions about the proper propriety of space flight altogether if people were likely to be killed or injured by falling space debris. It was an inauspicious ending to the first American space station. The experiment had whetted the appetite of NASA leaders for a permanent presence in space. Mm. So yeah, that's from Frontiers of Space Exploration.